morning, new day. I'm going to go ahead and open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11. Just a couple things as you're finding that in your Bibles. Um, a couple things coming up. In uh, about three weeks from tomorrow, we're going to have our, it's becoming an annual event, Rocky's Faith Day. It's a great time to spend some time together and worship together in a very different atmosphere than this one, but we uh, go out on a Sunday, watch a Rockies game. Afterwards, uh, some of the Rocky uh, players share their testimonies. And then there's a worship concert. We've seen uh, Jeremy Camp. We've seen Casting Crowns. This year, third day, we'll have the concert. And so we encourage you to come on out. Um, tickets, I think we have some left, about less than 20 tickets left. If you would like to get those, they're $21 each. We have a block of 50. It's a great time just to get some sun. Enjoy one another's company, get some baseball, and worship. What day is better than that? That's what I say. Talk to Kirk, uh, Kirk Samuels, or myself if you need tickets. Uh, we're going to hold those till next week, and then afterwards we'll hold a few. Price will go up a little bit, but if you want to get, make sure you get tickets, do that today or this week. Also, if you can believe it or not, we're just a couple weeks away from kids going back to school. Sorry, kids. One week for some of us? Wow. Um, as you know, at New Day, we um, love partnering with our local Adventist schools. And so if you have a student who is thinking of going to one of our Adventist schools, Castlewood Christian, Mile High, Campion, Wood Elementary in Aurora, please let us know because we would like to pay $1,000 of your uh, tuition this year. And so just let us know where they're going and we'll take care of the rest by sending a $500 scholarship per month, or excuse me, <laughs> per uh, semester. Per semester, let me clarify, everyone hear me? Semester per child. So uh, let us know, and we'll take care of that. Kids, our word of the day today is Moses. You count how many times you hear me say the name Moses. Write it on a piece of paper. Take it to the back afterwards. We'll have something for you. So we're in, in our sixth week of this series, Moses, Friend of God. And... and um, as I talk to some of you, some of you have been loving this series. You, know, you like learning about Moses. He's been a hero. It, the, the series is enhancing your spiritual life. Others of you, you don't say anything, but I know what you're thinking. How many more weeks of Moses can there possibly be? Well, believe it or not, today is the halfway point in this series. We are taking the whole summer to talk about Moses because... What we're talking about in Moses really gets at the heart of our purpose as a church as well as our purpose as individuals. Whether you realize this or not, you were created to know God, to love Him, to be in relationship with Him, to be in a faith relationship with Him, to obey Him, and to love the people around you and to serve the people around you. And there is so much that we can learn from Moses, and that's why we're taking a full summer on Moses. Moses was a passionate follower of God. I mean, he had a deep and an intimate relationship with the Lord. And contrary to popular belief, that relationship didn't just happen. But it, it meant Moses had to begin an intentional journey with God. And, and that meant he met, that Moses developed his relationship with God through some difficult circumstances, through some very hard choices, and even through some painful seasons of his life, the things that he was able to learn through those enhanced his relationship with God. And, and so wherever you are in your life today, I hope that you've been applying some of the lessons of Moses, the perspective and the mindset that he, he had when he hit difficult times in his life. Because I believe as we do the things that Moses did, choose God first and foremost over everything else, um, learn from our failures, seek to really know God through His Word, and say yes to Him no matter what. As we do the things that Moses did, we too can develop the kind of relationship of intimacy with God that Moses had. But today, Moses is going to learn perhaps his most important lesson in his journey with God. Now, we've got to admit, Moses was growing, right? He was growing, he was learning things, but there was yet another lesson God had in store for him that would kind of solidify the relationship and bring everything together. It would be the, the lens through which Moses was able to view God and view his world. And I can just imagine that in this place today, there are a lot of people here today who are going to be able to relate to Moses. Because Moses walked with God for quite a while, and he was getting to know God. 
He knew God was, was holy and sovereign and all-powerful, and he knew God was, was faithful. But it wasn't until he learned this next lesson that everything else fell into place. And this is your experience, too, for, for so many of you. Because today as we pick up the story, we're going to see that Moses learns the gospel, the good news of how God saves sinners. Now, last week, if you were with us, we studied Moses' really bad day, a, a day that went from bad to worse. And at the end of that day, Moses found himself alone, isolated, feeling rejected, rejected by the Egyptians and, and Pharaoh, rejected by his own people. And he goes back to God. He returns to God. And that's what we do on our bad days. We return to God. And there God meets him. And God sends Moses back to Pharaoh. He says, your job's not done. We're just getting started. And so began this incredible battle between God and Pharaoh, fighting over the people of Israel. I mean, this is like one of the most epic battles of history. I mean, there's stubborn Pharaoh, hard-hearted Pharaoh on one side, and then God, the creator of the universe. I mean, there's no doubt who's going to win this battle. But it is an epic battle and a fantastic story all the same. And, and this battle is a picture of the battle fought for you and me. I mean, we have to see that while these things really happen in history, they were a metaphor, a picture, a symbol of what God would do for all of humanity. This is a picture of the battle between Christ and Satan, the devil wanting to keep us locked in bondage, slavery of sin, but Christ continually coming to him and saying, let my people go. And, and so God wages his war against Pharaoh, and, and, and he does this through a series of plagues. Now, the plagues start moderately painful, but they get increasingly more devastating as Pharaoh continues to resist God. And if you know the story, or you've read it, or you've seen the movie, it started with turning the water of the Nile to blood, then to plagues of frogs, and then to gnats, and then to, to flies. And Moses continues to come back to Pharaoh and says, you know, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh continues to say, no. Right? And God then turns up the heat. And then there's a plague against the livestock. And then there's a plague of boils and of hail and of locusts. And a few times it looks as though Pharaoh's going to crack. He's, he's ready to relent. He's, he's ready to maybe give a, a concession or two. But then he continues to harden his heart and say no. Next comes the plague of darkness for three days. This was big for the Egyptian because this means that the God of the Hebrews was more powerful than the sun God of the Egyptians. How could he keep us in darkness for three days? And again, now it seems like Pharaoh is going to relent. He's going to, to give in, but he only gives in so much. And again, in the end, he hardens his heart. And he tells Moses, and this is in Exodus chapter 10, verse uh, 28. He says, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. And Moses replies, just as you say, I will never appear before you again. But before Pharaoh, or Moses leaves Pharaoh, he, he gives him this one last message from God, and it's found in Exodus chapter 11. Let's just pick up in verse 4. Just imagine, they're both, both these men are, are, are angry, and they're, you know, they're just like, you're not going to win. And so Moses says in verse 4, this is what the Lord says, about midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the slave girl, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. I don't know if you can kind of get the sense, but this is a different Moses than the one that we encountered at the burning bush. And it's even a different Moses from the one who was first sent to Pharaoh before that first plague. Uh, Moses seems to have a new confidence. 
But, but it's not a confidence in himself. Moses has a new confidence in God. He has seen the things God has done. And any confusion he had over who would be the deliverer of God's people were now cleared up. Moses now saw he was not the deliverer. But God would deliver his people. He would stop at nothing to set his people free. Well, now after nine plagues had failed to persuade Pharaoh, uh, Moses communicates God was about to deal this, this final blow. And he, he makes the situation very clear to Pharaoh. And he basically gives him five hard facts, five truths of what was, was about to happen. He says, something is going to happen at midnight. And probably wasn't that very night. God wanted to give Pharaoh a bit more time. It was probably a few weeks later, but it's coming at midnight. Number two, all of Egypt's firstborn sons will die. Number three, there will be national distress. Number four, Israel will be protected. And number five, there will be an exodus. God's people will go free. Now, if you're Pharaoh, you've got to know that the final plague is going to come. I mean, judgment is coming. And, and it's going to be devastating. God had defeated the gods of the Egyptians in all of the previous nine plagues. Surely Pharaoh couldn't doubt the fact that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. That the tenth plague would happen just like plagues one through nine. And, and it just occurs to me what pain and devastation could have been avoided in Egypt and in Pharaoh's household if he would just relent. I mean, if Pharaoh were a good leader of his people, the Egyptians, he would relent right now, but his heart remains hard. Now, any person with a heart feels for what is about to happen to Egypt, even though this is thousands of years ago. We cringe at the idea of, of God taking the life of every firstborn son. And, you know, this is a problem a lot of us have, have or uh, one of the problems a lot of us have. If you're here with us today and you're not a Christian, maybe this is one of those things that have kept you from God. You know, just the judgment side of God. We don't get it. We don't really like the judgment side of God. But just a few things to consider before we move on. First, consider this. If you were one of the, the Hebrews who were held in slavery all of your life, you might see this judgment a bit differently. I mean, judgment becomes kind of a beautiful thing when it's you who's being vindicated by that judgment. If you've got the scars of whips on your back from your taskmasters, you see this judgment completely different. Judgment becomes a beautiful thing when it's your oppressor that is being judged. Okay? And the second point I would make is this judgment wasn't necessary. Pharaoh and the Egyptians could have averted this painful plague by simply letting the Hebrew slaves go. They had plenty of evidence that God could and would do what he said he was going to do in this tenth plague. And that's why God gave the first nine plagues. He didn't want to take the lives of the firstborn in Egypt. And so he tries to convince the Egyptians to let the slaves go with lesser plagues, um, but they wouldn't budge. And this was the only way Pharaoh would finally relent. And finally, one more point on judgment while we don't like judgment, the fact remains. The wages of sin is death. It's an eternal principle, like one of the laws of physics. The wages of sin is death. And this judgment, again, is a picture. It's a symbol of the final judgment that's going to come to all who continually harden their hearts against a very patient but a very holy God. Again, this is a, I mean, a big symbol of what's going to happen in the end of time. I mean... Revelation tells us before Jesus comes again, there are going to be ten more plagues. And those ten plagues are going to precede the second coming in order to soften the hearts of those who are far from God. But just like for happened with, with Pharaoh, for most people, when those plagues fall, it will just hard, harden already hard hearts. And, and when Jesus comes in all of his glory and his holiness, just picture Moses, but Jesus is going to come and he's going to set his people free. And he's going to lead them to a promised land, just as Moses was doing. 
And for those who continue to reject him, they will experience his judgment, and it won't be pretty. But the fact remains, God wants no one to be lost. God wants everyone to come to repentance and salvation. He doesn't want to inflict judgment on when, when Jesus comes, nor did he want to inflict judgment on Egypt and have anyone perish then. But this is what the battle for God's children has come to. Well, with, with Pharaoh properly warned, Moses now goes to the Hebrew people to kind of tell them what was going on and get them prepared for this cataclysmic event they were about to experience. And he lays out a very strange plan, and he tells them that if they trust God, and they trust Him enough to do what He says, that they will escape the coming judgment that's going to fall on the Egyptians. They'll be able to pass through that judgment completely unscathed. And so let's read about this account together, and then we'll kind of go back and unpack it. We're going to read a little longer a passage here, but then we'll, we'll come back and unpack it with the remainder of our time. Uh, Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it, from the first day through the seventh, must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly, and another one on the seventh day. Do no work on on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Well, chances are you've um, heard of the Passover before and you have some understanding of maybe what some of these parts mean and symbolize, but every part of this story has deep significance uh, for our lives and for the way God deals with us today. And um, I'd like to unpack some of the various parts because really we have to understand not only was God preparing the Hebrews, to escape the judgment on the Egyptians. But he's also telling Moses and the Hebrews and us how he is going to eventually, what he would do to save all of us from the penalty of sin and the coming judgment on the world. So what are the various parts of this experience? There are many, but let me just kind of bring up uh, seven that are relevant for our experience today. The first one is they need to find A perfect lamb. You might have noticed this in verse 5. It says that they were to find a lamb that was one year old, a male lamb, without blemish. So why this standard? Why can't I just go and get any lamb? Why can't I just go and get the cheapest lamb of my flock? Why does it have to be a year old? Why does it have to be a male? Why does it have to be without blemish? Well, very clearly, this lamb symbolized the coming lamb of God 
who would take away the sins of the world, Jesus. So this was a, a, a precursor, a symbol of the Christ who would come to save us. And the reason it had to be a male was because it was the firstborn son of the home that was being spared. So the lamb was going to be a substitute for the one in the house who was supposed to die, the male. So it had to be a male lamb. And this very clearly points to Jesus. That's him being our sacrifice, our substitute. He became fully human, just as we are fully human, so he could be an adequate substitute for us, taking our sins to the cross. And so the fact that the lamb was male was just an, uh, an in indication that it had to be a good substitute for the one that was being saved. Well, why was the lamb without blemish? Well, of course, the outward perfection of the lamb was a picture of the inward perfect perfection, the moral perfection of Christ. Again, Jesus was represented by this lamb, and so a lamb without blemish foretold Jesus' sinlessness. Um, the New Testament talks about this, where I think it's Paul writing to the, uh, the Corinthians. He said, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin. He was sinless to be sin for us. So he took our sin on him as our substitute so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So he takes our sin, we get his righteousness. He's substituted on the cross for me and I get heaven that he earned. That's why the lamb had to be chosen carefully. Number two, they killed the lamb. Verse 6 says, all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter the lamb at twilight. And I don't know if you caught that part, but it said all of the people of the community had to kill the lamb. That would be pretty difficult, especially considering the fact, I don't know if you noticed in verse 2 or 3, that they had to take the lamb into their house about four days before they killed it. The family would learn to love this lamb. It became like a pet. It would sleep with the kids. It would eat from their table. You know, last week, uh, Kim and I, we, we, we did some turtle sitting for some neighbors of ours who were on vacation. And hard as it is to believe, I really connected with this turtle. <laughs> I mean, we bonded. And, you know, we had a thing, and, you know, we communicated and everything. And I couldn't imagine sacrificing the turtle at the end of the week. Now, I don't know if I could ever kill a lamb, period. But now... Imagine trying to kill a lamb that's been living in your house for the last four days. Again, sleeping with your kids, eating off of your table. Maybe you've given it a name. But this was intended to communicate the high price God gave when he gave up his only son. I mean, Jesus was no faceless sacrifice. This was the beloved of God. The darling of heaven was coming to be crucified. This cost heaven something. And no one could stay home because it was too hard or they didn't like the sight of blood. The entire community was to be involved in the killing of the lamb. Because again, the lamb represented Jesus. And they all killed the lamb, symbolizing that we all killed Jesus. You and I are responsible for the death of Christ, the death of the lamb. It's our sin, it's our rebellion that kind of drove those nails through his hands and his feet. We're responsible. It's my sin that took him there, therefore I am responsible. And that responsibility was communicated through the fact that everyone in the community had to come out together and take part in the sacrifice. Number three, they applied the blood. Verse 7 says, they were to take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the sides and the tops of the doorways in the house where they ate. And verse 22 says they were to do that with a, a bunch of hyssop plant. And it says that they were to stay in the house where they ate and not come out. It's like they were hiding behind that doorpost covered in blood. The blood was like a defense for them until morning while judgment was happening outside. And I've got to tell you, this step is so important. Because this is what made a sharp distinction between those who suffered judgment and those who escaped judgment. Those who lived and those who died. It wasn't enough just to kill the lamb. But they had to take the lamb and its blood and they had to put it on the doorpost. And that's what made the distinction, the application of the blood on the home. Erwin Rutzer, uh, Lutzer writes, 
Only blood on the door would save them. Think about this. A locked door wouldn't keep the angel of death at bay. Pleading ignorance or using some other excuse wouldn't spare anyone. Only blood. Those who applied the blood didn't have to defend themselves because the blood spoke for them. Think about that. You didn't have to go out and argue with an angel of death. You didn't have to deal with God. You didn't have to say, but I've lived a pretty good life. I wasn't a big sinner. I was a little, I was a little sinner, God. No, you didn't have to do any of that. The blood spoke. Think about that. The blood was completely sufficient to save whoever was inside of that house. And it didn't just cover up those with, with little sins while not being effective enough for those with the really big sins. There were no distinction between big sinners and little sinners. You either had the blood on the doorpost of your house or you didn't. How good you were, how moral you were, how bad you were, how evil you were, none of that mattered. Just think about this. Probably some of the firstborn in Egypt who died were better people, more moral people, than some of the firstborn in, Egypt, in Israel who lived. But it was all about the blood. If the blood was applied by faith, that's all that mattered. And I hope you're seeing how this is relevant for every one of us. God looks for the blood. When it comes time for judgment, he looks for the blood. Have you personalized the death of Jesus? Have you asked him to apply his blood on the doorpost of your heart, on the doorpost of your life? Again, in the words of Lutzer, he says, without it, without that blood, no small sinner can be saved. But with it, no big sinner can be lost. It's all about the blood. Number four, they feasted, or they ate the lamb. Verse eight says, that same night, you were to eat the meat roasted over the fire. Why do they eat the lamb who saved them? Well, the good news is, is the lamb that saves is also the lamb that satisfies. Not only would the lamb save them from the judgment by pouring its blood and giving its life, but he would then fill them. He, would, he wanted to consume them and satisfy them, give them enjoyment, give them pleasure. He would give them the energy they needed to begin their, freedom, their journey to freedom. See, Jesus does more than just forgive us by his blood. But he wants to have a relationship with us. A relationship of joy, a relationship of meaning. He wants to satisfy our souls. He wants to live inside of us and empower us for the journey he has for us, the way a good meal would do for a traveler. His indwelling presence will not only sustain us, but it will also satisfy us. Number five, they got rid of all of the yeast in their homes. And verse 15 says, For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day to the seventh must be cut off from Israel. This is an often overlooked, but I think very powerful symbol in the Passover experience. Yeast was a symbol for, anybody? Sin. Very good. I heard it in the back row. Yeast was a symbol for sin. And yeast symbolizes sin in that it has power. If anybody has done any baking, you know a little bit of yeast leavens the whole lump, right? Sin has power that's much greater than its size. It ends up spreading in our lives if not dealt with. This is the way Paul talked about it, again, to the Corinthian church. When speaking of sin, he said, Do you not know that a little leaven or a little yeast leavens the whole lump of dough? And have you experienced this in your life? That even a little bit of sin, if left unchecked, can consume our entire lives. And, and I believe this is why God instructs the Hebrews to search their homes and to get rid of all of the yeast as they prepare for the coming judgment. And this is a metaphor for a kind of a spiritual cleansing. It's an opening of my heart to God saying, God, search me. Expose the dark places of my heart. Show me where I need to yield to you, where I need to repent, where I need to welcome your Holy Spirit in, the parts of me that are being held back from you. 
You know, still today, um, during Passover, Orthodox Jews will still go through a ceremonial um, search of their homes to find any yeast and get rid of it. A reminder that their personal lives should be free from the corruption of sin. And what a great experience for those on a journey with Christ, whether just beginning or anywhere on the journey, just to systematically, periodically open ourselves to God. Say, God, where's the yeast? Where's the sin? Expose me. Cleanse me. I'm yours. Number six. I love this part. They began a journey of following God. This is a part of the Passover we often don't think about, but think about it. That very night, the night of Passover, the entire nation of Israel picked up. Men, women, boys, girls, they just left the only home that they had ever known. They left their lives of slavery, and they walked out as free men, women, and children. Now, they didn't really have much in terms of possessions. Um... They had no experience in wilderness survival, no training. They didn't even know where they were going. They just heard about some promised land. But they didn't need possessions. And the wilderness training wouldn't be needed either. They didn't even need to know where they were going. Think about this. They only had to believe God would provide for their needs and that he knew where they were going and that he would lead them one step at a time. I mean, again, what a perfect metaphor for beginning a journey, being on a journey with Christ. You know, once we've passed from death to life, once we've passed from slavery to freedom, we begin a new journey. We're set free from the slavery of sin, and, and we begin to follow Him. And we may not have everything that we need. We don't even know what we need. We may not know where we're going. We don't need to know where we're going. All we need to do is trust God is going to provide everything we need. And that He knows where we're going. And all I have to do is follow Him. One step at a time. And that leads us to the final and perhaps most essential part of the Passover. And and this is our part. Um, It's the part that we add or uh, have to play in this, this grand drama. And the part we add is faith. You know, our part, the Hebrews' part, was to trust God. Just trust Him. We have to believe that He can do and He will do what He said He will do. And that's not always easy. Can I get an amen? I mean, try to imagine yourself as a Hebrew. You may look back and say, well, it's easy for them. I mean, they were living in Bible times, right? They didn't know that. Um, Imagine being a Hebrew hearing the instructions about the Passover for the very first time. Kill a lamb after keeping it in your house for four days. I want you to paint your house with its blood. I want you to get all the yeast out of your house. I mean, you're listening to all this and you've got to wonder, this is going to save us? This? This is your plan? I mean, you've never heard of such a thing. Who had? This was all new stuff. And it must have been just you know, mind-boggling to these soon-to-be-freed slaves. But just stop and think about these instructions a minute. I mean, really, what logical um, reason was there for doing those things that Moses had instructed them to do and he said he, God had told them to do? I mean, why do those things with the lamb's blood? You know, it makes sense to us because we're on the other side of the cross and we're able to look back and see what everything symbolizes and how perfect The plan really was, how beautiful it was. But these folks had no clue. This was all completely out of the ordinary. Killing lambs and painting blood and all these things. But we would say to them, if having a conversation, we could say, well, it makes sense because God told you to do it. Right? And and that's exactly the point. Um, That's the only thing that made it logical. God designed a plan that only required one thing. Trust me enough to do what I told you to do. And just can you, can you trust me that far? Trust me enough to do what I asked you to do. Do these things and you will live. Now, you notice I made a little turn there because I was talking just about faith, but now all of a sudden I'm also talking about obedience. Well, I, I thought we were talking about faith. I, I like faith, but I don't like obedience. Obedience is a bad word in our culture, and obedience is a bad word in the Christian church. 
recently. And that's for a number of reasons. All of us are born with rebellious hearts. I mean, we are born fighting for our own independence. It is our default. It is our nature. But more than that, if you were born and raised in the last 60 or 70 years, you and I, we grew up in a culture that has put rebellion, the sin of rebellion, on a pedestal. Right? Really, rebellion is the heart of every sin. Rebellion against God, against the throne, against his law. I could do things my way. But our culture has taken rebellion and made it a virtue. We idolize people. We look up to people who live rebellious lives, the mavericks. They do it themselves, all on their own. They don't care what anybody else thinks. And so we don't like obedience. It's a bad word. Especially when it's connected to the gospel. But what we're going to see is that the reality is we can't separate faith from obedience. Because faith looks like obedience. Again, what sense did any of this Passover experience make? It only makes sense because it's what God said they were to do. And that took faith to believe that God would and could do what he said and that he even wanted them to do what he asked them to do. And that faith, though, would then lead them to obey God's Passover instructions. And if they didn't have the faith in order to believe, in order to do, without obedience to God's word in the Passover, none of them would have been saved. I mean, can you just imagine how they would have responded if, if they had no faith. If they didn't believe God or believe you know, that Moses had sent God, it would be like, um, you want us to do what? You're nuts, Moses. I mean, God is more powerful and mighty. He doesn't need us to do all that nonsense in order to save us. All we got to do is believe. We're not going to do that stuff. Just believe. And had they been, that been their response to the Hebrews and the Egyptians, would have suffered judgment during the Passover. Do you see how faith and obedience are inseparable? If I really have faith, I will do what God asked me to do. That's what faith looks like. Just as the Passover didn't make a lot of sense, a lot of rational sense to the Hebrews, so God's way of saving us doesn't really make a lot of sense either. Submit my life to Christ. Let Him sit on the throne of my heart. Allow Him to apply His blood to the doorposts of my heart, be baptized, follow the guidance of a 2,000-year-old book, doesn't really make a lot of sense. I don't need those things. I can just trust God. But that's where faith comes in. If I believe that He's really good, if I believe that He can and He will do what He said He will do, and I believe He's working on my half, my, on my behalf, and I believe he'll only ask me to do things that are in my best interest because he is good, then I would be willing to do whatever he asks me to do. I will surrender to him. I will be baptized. I will follow him. My faith will lead me to obey. Judgment is coming. Judgment is intended for the Pharaoh of this world who's trying to keep the people of God in slavery. And God doesn't want anyone to suffer judgment with the devil. And so he has provided a way of escape. And that way is Jesus. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was slain as our substitute. Yet three days later, he rose again, and now lives to apply his blood to the doorpost of our lives. And he wants to cleanse every one of us. He wants us to live in him, to hide behind the blood of the Lamb. He wants to guide us. He wants to provide for us. And, and for us to accept those terms, all we need is faith. Faith to accept him, faith to obey him. And the first act of obedience is that God wants us to follow him in being baptized. A symbol much like the Passover. It's a symbol that all of my sins have, have been washed away. And, and today, you can pass from death to life, from slavery to freedom. And in a minute, I want to give you that opportunity. But first, as I just wrap up, 
Knowing the good news of how God saves sinners makes all the difference in the world for those who follow him. It lets us know, again, that God is for us, not against us. It tells us it's about what he does for us more than what we do for him. It gives us a sense of freedom, that the blood is all sufficient, that it will do our fighting for us, and we do all the, it, he does all the work to save us, whether we perceive ourselves to be little sinners or, or big sinners. And I just imagine that Moses' relationship with God, when he learned the good news through the Passover, that in that his relationship went with God from good to great. And, and a lot of you have had that same experience. You know, a lot of you had, if you, you grew up in the church or you knew God for a while and you walked with him and you were getting to know him and you decided to follow him, but didn't really get this, this idea that God's blood is all sufficient, that all I need is faith. But then through some circumstances or some event, you learn this good news and it changed everything. Change the way you view God, change the way you view the world, change the way you view yourself. And maybe you even remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard this and got this for the first time. I remember for me, uh, I was, I'd been a Christian for about two years. I was in my, my mid-20s, and I was flipping through the channels one night, and I came to Dr. Charles Stanley, Southern Baptist preacher, uh, still on TV today, great teacher of the Word. And he was teaching on John 3.16. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Dr. Stanley kept making the point. It's all about belief. That's the only verb that's in there. You just got to believe. You got to believe that he can do for you what he said he's going to do. You got to believe so much that you're willing to follow him and, 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 and submit to him all of your life. But it's all just about believe, believe, believe. And that was all new to me. I was like, what in the world? And it changed everything. You know, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to say yes to that invitation that God gives us, the gift of Christ, and allow Him to apply His blood to your life. And if you haven't yet been baptized and crossed over from death to life, I'm just going to say, why not do that today? In a minute, I'm going to ask you to, to do something really bold. I'm going to ask you, if you want to cross over from death to life, have the blood applied to your doorpost, I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and make a decision for Christ today to have his blood applied to your life. But let me just say, standing isn't going to save you. Standing is just an act of faith, what's going in, on inside, and the standing is that outward symbol that you trust him. And I'm also going to say that this is the best place you could ever make that decision because you're sitting around a bunch of people who believe that's the best decision any one of us can make. And these are people who are going to, to cheer for you and celebrate for you. And so there is no need to, to be embarrassed or afraid in this context. Maybe some other context, but not this context. No need for inhibition here today. And so I bet that in a room this size, there's at least one person who needs to make a decision to say, you know what, yeah, today's the day, line in the sand, I stand for Christ, I trust Him, I want His blood in my life, I want to start a journey with Him, I want to learn to be baptized. And I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, I want you to stand. Not on two, not on one, but on three. All right? And, 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 and if you're, you're willing to accept Christ today, I want you to stand up. Okay? Just be bold. It, it doesn't mean you're going to be baptized today, but it means you're going to start the journey. All right? Resolve in your heart what you're going to do right now. If you want to... Begin this journey with Christ. I'm going to count to three. I'm giving you more time, though. Just really think this through. All right. This is the place to do it. Ready? One. One and a half. Two. Three. All right. Stay standing. Anyone else? Four. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you.